singing that song. His kids were dead and everything, and yet this is what came out of him when all that horrendous stuff had happened to him, guys. It's quite an amazing story behind that song. And um, when he found himself down and everything, but he turned to God and made a song like that that we still sing today, at least by 150 years, maybe longer, away from right there. So it's like Horatio Spavadio or something was his name. I don't remember exactly, but it's, it's an amazing song right there, I tell you. And it's, to think about the condition that guy made it in when he made that song right there. And, uh, and I'm glad everybody's here. We're going we're gonna to preach on 1 Peter chapter, 2 Peter chapter 3. We're done with the Peters as of this Sunday right here. And it's a, it's a great, uh, <coughs> great chapter right here. As I was studying this chapter, I was reading one commentary by a guy named Douglas Moo. He's written a lot of really good stuff. If you see Douglas Moo, that's the name that can be trusted right there. And, he, and this, uh, this last part talks a lot about the end of the world, final judgment. And kind of like, it's kind of like a wake-up call is what Peter kind of had for us to you know, wake up and really realize that we're living in days that are passing by. Things won't always stay the same. And that we're living for God. And he gave a great example I liked. He said that as he was writing this commentary on Peter and digging deep into it, the scriptures and everything. He said that he had a bout where he thought he might have cancer himself, you know, that might do him in right there. And he was stressed and he didn't get so much sleep and he had anxiety, but it caused him to turn to God. And he said he stopped being so materialistic in the world, and spiritually lackadaisical, and he started to he started to really get into the word and get into prayer. And then he said, they, they called him up and they said, it's not cancer, it's a minor procedure, you're going to be okay. And he said it wasn't long after that, he started getting lots of days of blue again right there because he didn't have that sight at the end like he did before when they told him, like, you're going to have cancer, you may die, where he really started thinking you know, about eternity and heaven and what's beyond and what's going to happen and everything. And he pointed out that story because he said it's kind of like what Peter's telling us this in this last book, of, last chapter of Peter right here. And... Uh, <clears throat> One thing, like we're talking about, I got a few statistics today I thought were kind of good to hand in here, is there's 260 chapters in the New Testament. I thought, wow, I usually preach a chapter Sunday. I've got at least 260 Sundays in the New Testament alone right here. All right? But out of those 260 chapters, there's 300 references to the end of the world right there, to the parousia is the theological term, parousia. So if you hear Parousia, you're like, what is that? You know, that song about the end of times, the end of the world. And uh, there's over 300 references throughout these 260 chapters from all the different authors inside the New Testament. So, so it's a very important thing. But yet at the same time, as I studied and I talked to some other guys this week, and some guys were like, yeah, you know, I know a preacher, and all he preaches about is the end of the world. That's all he preaches about. And they said it's very easy to get caught up with the end of the world, where that's all you ever concentrate on, that's all you ever talk about right there. And I thought, I know some guys like that too. And uh, so we don't want to be caught up where we're only balanced so much on the end of the world that we're not living in the here and now, you know, too. So it's a, it's a balance right there. It's like, uh, I don't know who said it, but I know it's some famous quote, as they said, you can't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. You know, we still, we still are right here among us and stuff like that. We can't be so much in the end of the world that we're not able to reach out to our fellow brothers and sisters and people that are lost and still be able to bring them in and connect them right there. But it's definitely something that's been talked about throughout the scripture and everything too. So I'll start the reading here. It's, uh, and this also, just, to, just so I don't forget, this chapter 3 kind of parallels Jude. Jude's just one chapter. You know, it's, uh, there's the epistles of John and then there's Jude. But this is, we're getting kind of the same thing as Jude. So if you want to later read over the book of Jude, the one chapter in there, you'll see a lot of parallels from Peter right there. But it says in verse 1, This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you. Beloved, in both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own spiritual desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact. The heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. 
But by the same work, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. All right, there's a lot to be said right here. And it connected a lot lately, because I told you I went to that creation museum for the evolution, uh, creation debate and everything, and that stirred up some things, and, and I really started looking to it, I started talking about it more, and different, different arguments and things were going on, and it really, I think this really points out the same exact thing as what those kind of arguments were going on, was it says here, it says that, it says that, uh, Forever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. All right, that's what it says. They say they, they, they says they will say, "Where is the promise of his coming?" Forever since the fathers fell asleep, they've always been going the same, right there. And uh, basically, people get so used to the here and now. You know, the day after day, every day is the same. You know, we have months they pass by. We've been in Februarys before. We've seen Marches come before. Told my kids and my wife, I said, "No, how's the same March comes in like a lion goes out like a lamb." I said, "We kind of know how the weather is, the different things. It's always the same, and people can get so caught up in this routine, same type thing in our short time that we live that they think it's just always going to be the same. It's not going to end. There isn't going to be any difference or anything." And in this passage, he reminds us. He reminds us that God created everything. That everything was originally water. And then we read about in the first chapter of Genesis that the Holy Spirit was dwelling upon the earth and everything and everything was all water and then God formed everything in creation and then he reminds us that God destroyed everything in creation with the flood right there and uh, people forget that the flood the flood was a, a, a giant thing I mean it killed everybody and it wasn't just like some people trying to say well maybe it was just a little part of Israel it wasn't this and that and every major culture of every major religion there's a flood story and if you ask guys that don't believe, they'll be like, well, everybody lived by a river. Well, we don't have any big flood stories like that, you know, from any recent time right there. We live by Lake Erie. People live by the ocean. I mean, we have flood stories like maybe tsunamis and things like that. But it's not like the type of flood that the stories are coming out from right there. And people want to forget that, it seems like. They forget that, this, that there was a big, giant thing that wiped everything out. And for the people living in Noah's days, it said that they were eating and drinking, carrying on and everything, while Noah was preaching to them. Noah was building his boat, and they just kept doing their things. They were marrying, they were having their same days. And then the, the floods came, God shut up the door of the ark with uh, Noah inside, and that was it. That was the end right there. You know, and they never thought the end was going to come, just as many then didn't think the end was going to come, and still many today don't think the end is going to come. You know, this wasn't like a book that was written so us in the year 2014 would read this and really understand it. This was well understood there in the first century when this was written also, because they were already scoffers that were scoffing. Some versions say mockers that are mocking. You know, it's almost like a, a rhyme type thing. You know, the scoffers are scoffing, the mockers are mocking. And this is what's going on. I got some some other examples too. Is is uh, until I got some cool statistic facts. I think you guys are gonna like them. You probably remember them like I do. You'll use it somewhere during the week. But it wasn't until 1885 that we ever had any cure for any disease whatsoever. It wasn't until 100 and what, 140 years ago, 130 years. I don't know. I'm a little off. But 130 years ago or so that we even had a cure for a disease. Before that, there was no cure for the disease. Think about the bubonic plague. The bubonic plague lasted for 100 years in the Middle Ages, right there, and it killed it killed about uh, it killed about 10 million people over 100 years. <coughs> now, something that we don't always hear about. Some of us do, some of us don't. I didn't know it was to this kind of extent. Is the pandemic flu of 1918 to 1919? The pandemic flu of 1918 to 1919 killed 100 million people is what it's estimated at. 100 million, 10 times more than the bubonic plague killed. And it was a virus. There was no cure. There was nothing they could do for these people. It was like the biggest outbreak of the flu we'd ever seen. And somehow, fortunately, by God's grace, the, viral, the viral type of you know, wickedness of the flu has gone down over the years and not gone up to the point of this flu in 1918-1919. It was more that killed 100 million people but it said that a third of the world had it. And I read another place that the only place that didn't have it was the places that had the, uh, the places that had, uh, there was like one place off the Amazon River, it's the only place they could find documented that didn't have anybody affected by this flu right here. And basically, three to five percent of the entire population of mankind died with this flu of the, 
100 million people with pandemic flu of 1918 and 1919. So those people's lives were changed, I mean completely changed right there. And it really affected America, it really affected Germany. It's when the war was going on, things they, you know, there's thoughts that maybe you know, the soldiers' immune systems were weaker, so that was what was perpetuating the war, and all those guys were dying, different things. But it was a, a terrible thing, and that only happened in 24 weeks. You know, we talk about the bubonic plague was 100 years, this is 24 weeks, it's a half a year, not even a half a year, killed 100 million people. You know, what's to say something like that can't happen right now today? You know, we were scared about that when H1N1 came out a few years ago, and now we're not even worried about it. We were smart H1N1, we're like, okay, they feel better. <laughs> it's, it's not as big of a deal. But yet, those are things that have really happened in history, and we tend to forget about them because they're not going on right now, right here, and we'll, think, we'll just keep going on. Every day is the same, just the same. And people think that, they think, you know, I don't have cancer, I'm not ever going to get cancer, I'm just fine and I'll always be the same. You don't know that. You may get cancer next week. I sure hope you don't. But it's life, we live on this earth, and things don't stay the same. And we can see from God's picture here reminding us that it's not going to stay the same. In fact, he tells us here at the end of this passage that it's been stored up for fire for the ungodly, that everything is going to burn up upon the earth. And we can think about that too. We know modern day science, we know how the nuclear explosion happens with the atom bomb and the atom actually separates. The atoms itself separate. And we know what kind of power can be in those atoms right there. And we can see it starts talking about stars and things like that, that the, uh, that the, you know, the stars will fall. If we read in Revelations chapter 6, verse 13, it tells us the stars are going to fall upon the earth. And I think, if I'm right, it's going to wipe out a third of the earth with these stars falling on the earth. Now, we already have... You know, cool action guy movies that talk about meteors and when they're going to hit the earth and what's going to happen. We have these uh, end of day type movies that we watch and we enjoy, but maybe we really don't think like, oh, that's never really going to happen. No, those stars are going to stay right where they are. Everything's going to stay just the way it is, and we're just going to keep going on. And uh, and the problem is, is uh, I wrote down this this great point right here, is. Uh, is people deny the positive that God made the world. You know, like these people that all want to say evolution, different things, they want to deny the positive things that, you know, it's a great story that God made the world in six days, that God made everything, that everything exists because Jesus made it right there, nothing was made that he didn't make, it says. But, but yet they, they also, they also in the negative that the flood happened, they deny that too. They deny that the flood ever happened, that there was a big giant flood, Lisbon flood, that changed everything and wiped everything out. And you can't really, with your theology and you're looking at the Bible, if you try to look at creation in some different version than a six-day creation or a young earth, then the real stump you're going to run into is when you run into Noah. When the whole earth was wiped out by this flood. And that was during, you know, not so long ago. You know, somewhere before 10,000 years ago. You know, maybe as early as 4,000 years ago with the flood that happened with Noah. And then you run into the problem how Jesus talked about Noah like a real person. He talked about Adam as a real person and so did other people in the Bible. Things just don't theologically line up. It's like almost like we have to take our Bible and think it's not really the Word of God or something if we start trying to look at it in different ways right there. But the biggest thing that I remember learning in seminary is that there's grand architect of the universe, that God was behind it all. So even the people that hold on to intelligent design or different things, you know, at least they're admitting that there's a God behind it that made it all. That we didn't just come up as we are. Uh, arithmetic, math, all these laws of physics, different things we figure out. They weren't just an accidental thing that just happened to pop up as they were right there. But they were all put in place by the, the grand architect, by, by our Savior Jesus right there when he made everything in the world right there. And there's a... Uh, and there's this argument, whenever I, I'm talking on Facebook, I'm trying to get away from this because it causes me stress some, but hopefully it does some good for somebody, but it's called an ad hominem argument, all right? And every time I talk to atheists on Facebook, they say, well, that's just an ad hominem argument. And I think, well, what is an ad hominem argument? I really don't even know, but this week I found out what an ad hominem argument really is, all right? Ad hominem argument means you're doing an argument by ridicule. You know, so like if somebody says, well, you're a Christian guy, and that's just ad hominem argument you're using. They're basically feeling ridiculed because you're telling them that there's a judgment that's coming. There's a God who's made a way for us, but there's also a hell and there's a judgment and there's a future to look toward right there. And they call that ad hominem because you, they think you're ridiculing them then. You're trying to, you know, do an argument by ridicule. And here, we can see the perfect scripture here. It says, it says uh, like I said, it says in verse 3, it says, Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing. 
know, they're doing their ad hominem, ad hominem argument right there, following their own sinful desires. And then, and then they, they're, so they're talking about all these different things right here, and we can see by the story of the flood that it attests that their sin does have judgment also. There was a penalty for sin. It's not just, you know, God doesn't just love everybody and says, don't even worry about your sin, everybody's just fine. You know, we can see throughout the Bible, when I was a younger guy, I used to read the Bible and I thought the Old Testament was so harsh because there's so much death and killing and disease and awful things going on. But it wasn't until that I really started getting kind of spiritually mature that I could see that all this was still the grace of God. There were always some that were saved. There were always some that made it through all of this judgment. And it really shows you how much God hates sin. God hates sin so much that he sends judgment for sin that the earth's going to be burned up with fire if you take this literally. You know, which we could picture maybe a nuclear explosion or maybe some stars hit us. I, I bet some, some of these stars, they're burning at 12,400 degrees Fahrenheit that are up there in the sky. Imagine how hot that is right there. You know, our ovens get like, what, 450 degrees or something? Tremendously hot right there. But we can see right here that, uh, that it's, it's just like, uh, it's like Moses' followers in uh, Malachi 2.17. This is an Old Testament verse I want to read to you right here. I liked it. And when, when Mo, this is about talking about Moses, is, you know, when back in the, he was in the, when he was walking, he said, You have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, How have we wearied him? By saying, Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, Where is the God of justice? There was a guy, there was a guy this week, and he showed me this atheist post, and he basically had two sides of some big atheist guy. The guy said, no matter what, though, even if we're wrong and there is a God, and we're trying so hard to fight against him, we're still good people. And if he's a good, loving God, we're going to be just fine in heaven. And I told that guy, there's, there's no story in the Bible about some guy who was a good guy that went into heaven right there. You know, it's always by faith and repentance, belief in Jesus Christ. The only way that we escape judgment, that we escape, because we all sin. None of us can say we're without sin. We're all sinners right there. We're lying to ourselves and we're really blind if we think we don't have any sin. The only way we escape it is because Jesus paid that price for our sin for us. So we don't have to pay that price for our sin. And, and uh, from the way I understand the Bible, and many do, there's going to be a rapture one day. We're going to be lifted out of it before everything's burned up with fire and all these kind of things. So... So I'm not so worried about, you know, the day of fire and everything. And if I was around the day of fire, I'd still know that the moment I die is going to be the moment I'm with Christ. But I believe that we're going to be, we're going to be gone from before this final devastation happens. We'll still see it. We'll still be around. But we'll be on the other side watching things. But it talks about, uh, it talks about this, uh, that, that everything was deluged with water. You know, that it was all deluged with water. The whole world is what it says right there. It was deluged with water. But God's judgment is certain, just as certain as that flu killed 100 million people. God's judgment is coming also. Just as certain as all these places in the Old Testament talk about how Jesus was going to come and the Messiah would come. He came just like it said. You know, and uh, but it's going to happen. But we're going to read when it's going to happen. We don't exactly know when. But we're going to see some things about the wind because that was a big question they had back then too. And they thought, well, it hasn't happened yet since Jesus is gone. It's never going to happen. It's going to stay the same. And this is 2,000 years later, and it still applies just as much today as it did back then. It says, but do not, in verse 8, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for it and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will set on fire and be dissolved? And the heavenly bodies will melt, will melt as they burn. But according to the promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. <clears throat> all right, so right there it talks about the wind a little bit, all right? This is the one verse that everybody tries to say 
for evolution that you know is that one day the God says a thousand years. Well, even if one day says a thousand years, you look at it six days, six thousand years, okay? So I'll give you ten thousand years of day creation, maybe. But this is pretty much if you look in context, it's always good that we read scripture in context. This is reading in context right after it's talking about when judgment's going to come. When uh, all these people are saying, ah, oh, it's been the same every day, it's not going to change. And it's telling us that to God, one day could be as a thousand years. You know, he said we're in the last days. Back in Jesus' day, he said we're in the last days. Paul said we're in the last days. They all, 300 different times, we see about us living in the last days right now. And if one day is a thousand years, we, we've been around for a little over two days right now, you know, since Jesus said that. But we can see, once again, his mercy, as we saw in the Old Testament, where we can see all that death, but yet, if we look, we also see people being saved, people coming through it, people with salvation, people being spared. Because it says right here, it says, but it's, it's patient towards you. God has a tremendous patience right there. God's giving more patience, because why? Because he doesn't wish that any should perish. He doesn't want anybody to perish and, and be just be wiped out when this judgment comes, the people that don't come to him. It says, but all that should reach repentance, okay? So God, 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 what God, uh, what God wills and God decrees are two different things, you know, because we can also get caught up in this and say, well, everybody's going to be saved because God says here he wants everyone to repent. He doesn't want anyone to perish. But yet, when we read in context, we see, he says, many will perish right there. He says, there's a highway to hell and a narrow path to heaven. So, you know, somewhere in God's love and his great wisdom and his perfection, there is some kind of a free will look that we get to decide if we're going to follow him or we're not going to follow him right there. And he's actively involved in drawing us to him, too, for sure. And he wants us all to come to him. He doesn't want anybody to perish or to go to, go to the terrible place where he made for, for, the, for the demons, for the fallen angels. But he said... But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. You know, it is going to come one day. But God's being patient. You know, more and more days. The more days that go on, more guys are getting saved. You know, I know I'm only, you know, 40 years old. And I, I wasn't a Christian from the day I was born, that's for sure. There was a day that I was saved right there. And it's probably all of you can think of there was a day that you were saved. Think of the day of the Lord had come before that, would you have been saved? You know, where would you be right now if the day of the Lord had already come right then? So we can also think about all the people out there that are lost. You know, it's, God's being patient. God has a love for them also. It says in John 3, 16 that he has a love for the entire world right there. And he's being patient before this day of judgment and these things are coming. We can't say what day God's going to come. You know, they asked Jesus, when is the end death going to come? And he said, not I know, but only the Father knows. So if it wasn't good for Jesus to say when the last day was going to be. How is it that some man can think? It's going to be this year right here, or it's going to be this, this day right here. I've calculated out. I figured it. We don't know it, but yet we should always live as if it's about to come. We should live as that guy Douglas Moo wrote where he found out he may have cancer, that he might die, that he's starting to think more in heavenly things. He's starting to get more into his Bible. He's starting to pray like it's a reality right there. That's the way we should be living every day right there. And no matter what, I always tell people all the time when they hit this end time subject, when they try to figure it out, I say, there's, it, it's going to come soon either way. Either you're going to die, because you know none of us really live past 100. A couple folks do, but not far past 100. And the ones that do, sometimes they don't really know that they're still living, maybe. All right? But 100 years isn't long. So somewhere in the next 100 years, every one of us in this room probably won't be here. Maybe the little girl right here, these little guys, maybe they'll live a little bit longer. But all of us that are adults right now, we won't be around here anymore. So we can't just keep saying, oh, don't worry, it's going to happen every day like it is. Because one day you're going to die. It's going to wipe out, you're going to die, and you're going to be no more. And then what you did with your life and what you did with Jesus, it's all that's going to count. And we can see that there's, there's actually, I didn't know about this, I found out today this week. There's all these isms when you study theology, like something's an ism. There's something called uniformitarianism. They, they uniform themselves to everybody else, a uniform way of thinking. You know, think about the way our culture is. You know, if you start talking about God, you start talking about the flood or creation or evolution, different things, there's all this uniform way of thinking. They all adopt it to be uniforming, thinking this is the way it is, this is how it is right here. And it's not a good way to be thinking right there. A lot of problems happen with uh, uniformitarianism right there, that's for sure. Like we can see, we can see that the, the, the present is the key to the past. And that things will always be the same. That's what uniformitarianism says. That because the way we live right now, it must have always been this way. 
And that's the way people try to judge evolution and creation and things. They say, well, we know this is right here now, so it must have always been that way. We don't have any idea because we don't know how things were before. You know, God could have created things in an old state. God, probably the way it looks like when we read the Bible, Adam was never a baby. You know, God wasn't nursing him with the bottle, bottle or something. Adam was a full-grown man when he made Adam right there. We don't know how God made those kings, but it's better, in my opinion, and I think biblically, to believe what the Word says no matter what anybody else says right there. You know, if somebody comes up and says, strange idea or something, stick with what the Word says. Don't change it right there. That's why I said that's happened with the church in America and different things. Things used to be a little bit more on fire for God in the 1800s and things, and evolution came along. The schools all said, oh, now we know it's all evolutionists and that. We don't have to worry about God anymore. They just kind of stepped everything out. A lot of churches said, oh, okay, we'll, we'll moderate and change our theology too to be the same way. And we can see where it's gotten us right there. It's gotten us farther away from God, and now they pretty much have figured out that it's not evolution like the way Darwin said it, that's for sure. You know, that's, and everybody held on to that for the longest time. But they should have held on to the book right here. It's held on to it for a lot longer than those things. But we can see in these last, last things right here, it's verse 14 on to the end. It says, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people, and lose your own stability, but... Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and today and to the day of eternity. Amen. Alright, so He's telling us to stay holy, stay without blemish, keep ourselves in the world. Don't get tainted up with the world with all these problems. And He talks about Paul and how uh, the letters that Paul wrote. And he talks about them like in an authoritative manner. You know, when you talk about how do we get the Old Testament, well, the Old Testament canon is what they call it, like the way that it was measured, how we had it. Well, a lot of it was verified from the two New Testament because Jesus cited from a lot of verses from the Old Testament, different things. So we know if they were good enough for Jesus to be Scripture, they're good enough for us to be Scripture. And then in the New Testament, it makes it a little bit harder because we don't have a book after the New Testament. But the New Testament guys cite each other right there. You know, Paul cites it of himself that all scriptures breathe from God. And over here we see Peter citing Paul right there. You know, so these guys are all apostles, they're citing each other. That's scripture, these are the right things. And he talks about how Paul had a uh, he's, he had some things that are hard to understand. You know, even though the book is simple, the simplest man can understand this book looking at it. It's also the most smartest man cannot understand some things that are in this book right here because some things are very hard to understand. Some things we probably won't figure out until we get to that side of heaven right there. That we'll be able to look back and look, of course, that's the way it was right there. But it says that the ignorant and unstable have twisted the scripture to their own destruction. And like we talked about in the last chapter of all these false religions and cults and different things and how they twist scripture to change things and usually centered around Jesus in the first place as they do it right there and who Jesus is. And it says, be careful. It says, you know, be careful. And it tells us what we should do. We should keep growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. How do we do that? Keep getting in the Word. Keep praying. Keep fellowshipping. Keep uh, worshiping. Keep coming together. We need each other. Throughout the Bible, you'll see a common pattern where it's kind of like not beating us up, but it keeps telling us, like, hey, remember to do this. Or, hey, remember that. Or, hey, stay focused on God. And it's something that we need, the way God built us. We need each other. We need church. We need to keep growing. We need to keep moving together. We can't just be that guy that sits in this house and be like, I'm a Christian and believer, but believe me, I don't go to any church because I can't find a good church. Well, I wonder if you really watch his life and how much, or if he recorded his own time, how much thought he gives toward God or how much time he spends with God. I bet you it's very, very little. You know, people that don't come to church, people that don't, that are all on their own like that, I bet you they have very little time that they actually spend with God and they actually grow. And it's because we need each other. We need each other to keep growing. We need to keep encouraging each other. We need to keep each other accountable. We need to keep in unity right there. And it talks about the law too. You know, because as we talk about judgment, we talk about law. And Martin Luther had a good saying. The, the old Martin Luther, 500 years ago. There's good sayings from the new Martin Luther too, but I don't have one of those right here. But Martin Luther from back then, he said, the law is what we give to God. You know, the law written in the Bible, all this moral law, 
We don't have to do sacrifices anymore, we know, because Jesus was a sacrifice, the Bible tells us so, or all those kind of laws. But all the moral law, we still give it back to God right here. And the gospel is what he gives to us. Jesus gives us life through the gospel. We have the life from him, from the gospel story right there. And that love is the key, but it does not replace the law. You know, even though it's all about love and everything, what God's word is and what sin is and what sin's not is still sin. It hasn't changed or anything like that. We still need to follow what the Bible says. And if we look real quick at Matthew chapter 5, verse 18 and 19, which is a hard chapter, it's called the Beatitudes chapter of Matthew. If you read them, anybody reads them, you'd be like, ooh, ooh, oh, it's me. I need to, I need to. You need to adjust myself, is what you do, as you read Matthew chapter 5. But it's basically Jesus' talk. The Sermon on the Mount is what they call it. And in Matthew 5, 18 and 19, it says, For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So we can't just say, you know what, that's too rough of a law that God had right there. I'm not going to follow that. I'm not going to listen. He says, be holy, you know, uh, be godly and everything. That's too much. There's no way I could do that. It's just going to be, you know, how the rest of the world is. I'm going to uniform myself to them right there. That's not what we're being called to be. It says that it will be least in the kingdom of heaven, you know. I don't believe anybody can lose their salvation if you genuinely say but, you know, I don't want to be least in the kingdom of heaven either. I'd rather be in heaven than not be in heaven. But I want to do something. I want to, I want to do something for God what I can with my time. You know, I, I bet you we still remember with what goes on when we're on the other side of heaven. And I want to think, man, I'm glad I was fervor, so I'm glad I did something for you, God. I'm glad I was on fire for you. And I didn't just kind of float along like a, like, a, like a frog on a log that's just floating down the stream, you know. I'm glad I was out that frog that jumped out and I was swimming to the side or trying to tell some other frogs, like, hey, let's go this way. There's some poison water coming down the stream quick. Let's get out of here, you know. Something. And that's the way, that's the way I, I want to be, and I want to see, see everybody else be like that, too. I want to see us it's fired up right there. And uh, another quote I spawned to that was great was, nothing will enlarge the soul of man more than the subject of God. The more we think about God, the more it enlarges our soul. There's nothing greater we can study, not mathematics, not uh, chemistry, not anything, more than studying the subject of God. That's going to make us grow inside and it's going to enlarge us as people right there. That's for sure right there. But, uh, <laughs> so we went through these scriptures here and we saw these points and that all things don't continue the same way. Things are going to change one day. Whether it's the end time coming, the earth being destroyed by fire. There's a lot of theological argument about that. Is it really going to be destroyed by fire? Or is that just metaphorical? But if you study stuff metaphorically, it doesn't work out to be like an easier, softer type of path. To me, if you look at the metaphorical guys, their stuff's even harsher than being destroyed by fire. So I take the Bible as literal as I can wherever I see it. So, so yeah, I do think that eventually the earth will be destroyed by fire. And the universe and the stars and everything, like it says right here, what's going to happen. But it's all going to be made brand new again. And it doesn't matter. It's not that they're going to be gone. That verse we talked about, those who are asleep, you'll never find someone that's sleeping in death in the Bible that wasn't a believer. It doesn't talk about the unbelievers as those that are asleep. And just because their body's asleep until the day of resurrection, we know from what Paul said, he said, he said, if I am not here, I am present with the Lord. We're not sitting down on the ground waiting and waiting until the day of resurrection. We are with God immediately. Our body may be not with us right there. You know, it may be burned up or something, but God's an amazing guy. He can speak a word and it comes back into being, which one day we'll have those bodies back. But, uh, but we're going to be forever right there. We're going to live forever. There was a lady this week I talked to. It was the saddest thing. Her husband just died a, a month ago. And she told me, she said that she said he, he loved life so much and he just wished that he was going to live forever. That's what he told us right there. And it was a sudden death. He had a heart attack. Within two hours, he was dead right in the living room floor. Right in the farmhouse, right where we were standing, it was just, it was just really sad. It broke Lay's heart. She's still dealing with it. And I didn't know if she was a believer or whatnot, so I didn't engage her real hard on it. But I thought, I thought he is going to live forever. Every single one of us is going to live forever. It's, but it's going to be in one place or another place. And that's all. I prayed to God if I was a believer. A lot of farmer folks like that seem to be believers. There's a lot of Bible belt down there. So I sure do pray and hope that he is like that. But he is living forever. And every one of us is going to live forever. 
And we should cherish these days. And uh, talks about Ecclesiastics that we should take glory in our work. You know, be happy with the work that we do, and be happy with what we can do, and be proud of that. Because what else is there really to be proud about right here on earth, right there? But we can always look forward to the time with God, the time in eternity. Somebody tried to give me this book called "Today, the Best Day." Today is the best. Live your best life now. They tried to give me this book this week, and I saw this book, and man, did it make me upset. I probably told the guy too harshly what I thought about the guy that wrote that book. I thought he was a heretic, this and that. And I thought, man, this guy likes this book. I probably have to be careful. I don't want to you know, hurt my friend's feeling right here. But it's not about living your best, best life now, unless your picture living your best life now is living for Christ today, right now because it's going to carry over into eternity. It's not about what can I get right now with riches and these different things. It's about what can I do for God is what it's all about right there. It's not the focus right there. It's nothing wrong. We're supposed to provide for our families. It says if you don't provide your family, you're worse than an unbeliever, it talks about in the Bible. But it's not all focused about right now. Our main focus should be on Jesus, and we should always keep reminding each other, and just as the Bible reminds us, and more and more we read it and we look through it and preach, is that we're supposed to follow Christ to the best of our abilities and be obedient, be holy, and watch after Him. And none, and none of us know, we all know, that no matter how good you want to be or how good you follow the Bible, if you don't have Jesus, you still don't have any hope right there. There's no way that we're working our way to heaven in the least bit. It's like Martin Luther said, we're showing our love to God from following the law right there. And the law is given us so we can love God, and God shows His love to us by the gospel because He's made a way for us. They paid the penalty and was a substitute for us on the cross. But we'll go ahead and we'll do communion now. And let's do that communion we did before where we all get in a circle and serve one another right there. If you guys want to come along right here. And I hope he doesn't wake up the baby. <laughs> right here.